All right. Well, first of all, um, welcome to Ship to Shore. Um, pretty much it's an overall program, just purely about the Great Lakes region, um, mostly about the history. Uh, but there's a lot more uh, that I will most likely get into that people might find interesting. Um, now, just a quick little fun little tidbit. Uh, the name that I, the reason I named it Ship to Shore was purely because I thought it sounded cool. And there is a uh, type of radio called a Ship to Shore radio that, that was like introduced around the 1940s. And I'm like, man, you know, all this, these other names were taken. So I'm just going to use this one. <laughs> like, I remember there was one I was like, the like, sounded so cool. But somebody I really admire took it. And I'm like, man, he might sue me. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, and it's not only going to be uh, history from around here. It's also going to be from far off all the way over to Duluth. Doesn't really matter where it is at, um, as long as we're not going over to the ocean because I don't know that much about that. <laughs> um, now, first of all, in this first uh, picture you see here, this is in Ashtabula. You can read it right at the top there. This is where Penny Dock is now, um, which doesn't look like Penny Dock, obviously. <laughs> uh, it's Kinder Morgan, but I call it Penny Dock. Um, and this is where uh, Woodland Beach Park used to be, kind of right over this area. Used to be a roller coaster ton of neat stuff over there. Was not much by 1940. Uh, that has a long history that I won't get into. <laughs> but uh, as you can see back here, you can see the Hewlett's. Um, you folks know what the Hewlett's are. Um, and then there is a lake freighter right here. Looks like he's either getting unloaded or he's getting loaded. I have no idea. <laughs> um, as it says, it's a program detailing history from the Great Lakes region. All right, so we're going to go to the next uh, page here. And I'm just going to ask you these three questions. Why the Great Lakes? Aren't the Great Lakes too small? And shipping on the Great Lakes has to be recent, right? And the top one, I'm not going to answer just yet, because uh, that's going to, I'll answer that in the next, <laughs> next slide. Um, the Great Lakes. Now, the second one I am going to uh, talk about. Now, how many, or probably, I probably shouldn't ask how many of you live by a Great Lake. We all live here, pretty sure. <laughs> or have been by Lake Erie. Um, but it is funny anytime somebody from like over in like Florida or somewhere not even close to the Great Lakes, and they'll come by and they'll be like, what, what is that? Is that an ocean? And you're like, no, that's Lake Erie. They're like, that's not a lake. And it just kind of shows you and just the surprise of uh, how people think that aren't from the, uh, the Great Lakes region. And the fact that we have shipping on the Great Lakes just shows you how big they are. Um, I know when I sailed for a short time, it took us, let's see, maybe three days to get across Lake Superior. Um, and even Lake Erie, uh, as small as she is, she's pretty long and pretty rough. And you know these these lakes are referred to as inland seas for a reason. Um, and we'll get into that uh, in the next uh, slide. Um, third one, shipping on the lakes it has to be recent, right? No. Uh, the Great Lakes have been pretty much used in some sort of trade ever since about the 1600s, uh, primarily with the, uh, the French. Uh, they were selling a lot of the fur pelts with the uh, indigenous peoples. Um, and that kind of like kick-started it, but then you had that lull, and then, you know, we had a bunch of these people coming over from England and everything, and then they eventually found the Great Lakes, and then that kind of started. Uh, really early. Uh, now, I haven't really researched into like when it really, really started, but I know by the early 1800s, um, you had shipping on the Great Lakes, and of course, you had the War of 1812. Um, with, you know, you have ships all going all over, um, and uh, obviously, uh, 
Commodore Perry. So we know about that guy. <laughs> so we're gonna go to the next, uh, next one here. I'm gonna go around here for a moment. All right, I should probably turn this towards myself. All right. So, ooh, that is gonna fall. That's not good. There we go. <laughs> oh, okay. So, there are five bodies of water that make up the Great Lakes. You have Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, and Ontario. Um, as I've said before, they are pretty much considered inland seas purely on how big they are, how dangerous they are. Um, I know that up in Lake Superior, the highest recorded wave so far, uh, I believe it's about 35 feet. Lake Erie, despite how shallow she is, she has had 13 foot waves, which is taller than me, so that's scary. Um, now, usually, I'm sure you guys know on how to remember uh, those five Great Lakes, homes. Now, other than the five Great Lakes, there are significant but smaller bodies of water that also make up this huge system of not only shipping, but animal life and so on. You have Georgian Bay, Green Bay, Traverse Bay, Lake St. Clair, and the Saginaw Bay, all of which have their own really fascinating history that I kind of want to go into eventually. <laughs> um, specifically, Georgian Bay, uh, it is pretty much considered like almost a sixth Great Lake. It had its own shipping, had its own, has its own stories and everything, despite it being kind of tacked on to Lake Huron here. Um, interestingly enough, and I'm not sure how many people know about this, but Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are technically the same lake. They just decided, well, we're just gonna make them two different lakes, and we're gonna say this is the Strait to Mackinac. <laughs> uh, over here is Green Bay. Uh, I have a personal con connection with Green Bay and my family. Um, but again, just another area that is really just teeming with history, especially in the Gore County area. Um, actually, later on, we're going to be going to that area, talking about St. Martin's Island, and it's not the one in the Mediterranean, I promise. Uh, other than that, you have the Traverse Bay right here, uh, which is with well-known cities such as Traverse City uh, and Rogers City, which is famous for a very unfortunate reason. Um, there was a shipwreck that uh, happened around the 1958, uh, and it took pretty much half of uh, the men's population there, um, since half of the crew were from, all from Roger City, um, which is probably gonna be something down the line that I will talk about, uh, purely because it's fascinating and it's also rather tragic. Um, other than the tra uh, Traverse Bay, you also have Lake St. Clair, uh, that, which is, it's an interesting part because I feel like it's the only like different like mass of, of water <laughs> that we have to kind of go through purely because you're going from Lake Erie up to the Detroit River and you have to go right into the Lake St. Clair and then into the St. Clair River to get up to Port Huron here. And unfortunately there are a lot of uh, boaters over there that uh, aren't, very, uh, aren't very smart. <laughs> That's, I'm gonna put it lightly. <laughs> I've, I've heard very bad stories over there, but it's okay. <laughs> um, other than that, you have the Saginaw Bay right here, which I found out recently, it is teeming with shipwrecks. Literally, like there is a whole, like there could be a whole uh, program just on this. Uh, and all up through here, there are so many shipwrecks along that shore, it is mind boggling. and kind of an interesting little tidbit, a lot of the shipwrecks actually happen near the shore, not in the deeper waters. And that's kind of why you see all the bones of these old shipwrecks all along the shore. And if you just even just look up like some of these uh, different areas, especially the protected ones, you'll see just there's a whole list uh, that people will dive on, want to see, so on and so forth. Um, other than that, there are also the rivers that connect the five giants. Um, the Chicago River, Calumet, 
St. Mary's, Straits of Mackinac, the St. Clair River, the Detroit River, Welland Canal, and the St. Lawrence Seaway. Now, some of those are not technically rivers. I think I just wasn't thinking at that point, but it's okay. Um, and a lot of people don't realize, again, that the Straits of Mackinac is technically a river. They consider it a river, at least, <laughs> even though it's this huge stretch of, of water. Um, and it's also one of the most dangerous parts on the Great Lakes. Um, now, I've already pointed out the, Det uh, the Detroit River and the St. Clair River. There's also the St. Mary's that heads up to the Sioux Locks up over here. Um, and uh, some of these other ones, I have no idea where they are, <laughs> uh, like the Calumet. Uh, Chicago River is kind of self-explanatory. It's over by Chicago somewhere. I think that's Chicago. I could probably wrong, but it's okay. Um, and then going up past Lake Erie, you have the Welland Canal and then the St. Lawrence Seaway out to sea, which is interesting because a lot of Canadian boats will usually go up the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, now, going back to that question of why the Great Lakes, all of this information here and more is purely why. There is such a rich, diverse history in the Great Lakes. Um, I know for, from working at a museum for the longest time and working with Kathy, um, really it's just there's so much that you can find out, not only human stories, but just really fascinating um, just little little side stories that might be might take you like a minute to read, and then you'll be like, "Huh, I learned something new today." And like even just Ashtabula here, we have a ton, a ton of history, just on that river and on the outside of the of the harbor. Um, and we'll get into that eventually. <laughs> um, and obviously, there are what is I think is pretty interesting is that there are approximately 35,000 islands on the Great Lakes. And what I was most surprised by, it's not on Lake Superior and it's not on Lake Michigan, it's on Lake Huron. The, and a lot of them are up in this area right up here. And I was like, where did Huron get all those islands? Can we have some? We've got like five. <laughs> We've got like, they're, and they're all over here. That's it. <laughs> um, now, one of the most interesting things also, and I'm not sure how many of you folks know this, there are approximately, and it's an estimate, 6,000 to 8,000 shipwrecks. And pretty, pretty much about half of those are in Lake Erie, despite her being shallow and uh, mu muddy, mucky. There, there are a ton of shipwrecks that have never been found on Lake Erie, and a lot of them that have just never been even like talked about. They were never in the record books. Um, I mean, even though we don't have the oldest shipwreck, we still have the most. Um, about 800 to 1,000 shipwrecks just on Lake Erie alone. Um, and a lot of really just fascinating stories um, from both sides. Um, now, I'm coming from an American perspective, but the Canadian side also has some fascinating history just from the, the shipping industry, to everything that they did over there. And one of them I will tell you real quick. So before we had prohibition in the US, Canada had its own prohibition. And they decided, well, we're, we want alcohol over there. So they started doing their own little, little rum running operations. Uh, they would work with folks along the American shore and they would uh, ship alcohol over to, to Canada. And then that kind of went downhill and we got into prohibition, but didn't, didn't mean it deterred anybody. And it primarily came out of Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, and there's just a lot of really unique, just little, little stories from that rum running age too. Um, a lot of the rum running happened on the Detroit River uh, and Lake St. Clair. Um, another one I really found interesting too was Al Capone owned, owned a ship on the Great Lakes that was doing rum running. And that has its own history with Long Point over here, another really fascinating part of the Great Lakes. Um, and I, I'll never forget the one story I had from, uh, from this Canadian rum running uh, folks over here that uh, 
so one way they were able to smuggle uh, all that alcohol over into the U.S. over here and into Canada, they would use the old fishing tugs, and they would go out fishing, and they would have all the alcohol in the bottom of the barrels and everything, and they would put the fish on top of it, so when they went into the harbor, they, all, all the authorities would see was fish. Um, and um, this is where the term midnight herring comes from, and that's a very good book. Uh, talks about that whole thing. Um, now, as I kind of explained in the previous uh, slide, shipping has been a staple on the lake since the 1600s and before, mainly being indigenous peoples and French explorers. Um, probably the most famous one that we know is La Salle um, and the, the Griffin, which has still never been found um, after it pretty much disappeared after they dropped him off. And really, I don't know if we'll ever find that shipwreck purely because it's so old. Um, I know, let's see, ever since probably the 1920s, people have said, oh, I found the Griffin, and then it's not the Griffin. That, and it's still happening. I'm serious. There are, there are so many people that say, I found it, and then people are like, no, you didn't. So uh, this next area is I'm going to show you all the little key points that I, that I think are really fascinating about these five inland seas. We've got as I was talking before, Long Point. It kind of stabs like a dagger into the middle of Lake Erie. Um, there's a lot of history there, and it happens that a lot of ships have run aground there. I wonder why. <laughs> um, Lake Erie has its islands. Um, uh, there's uh, Point Pelee as well. Uh, there's, and there's just a lot of just really interesting stuff just along this shore. Um, one of my favorites is Johnson's Island because uh, during the Civil War there were uh, Confederate guerrillas that were trying to uh, uh, release a bunch of the prisoners from Johnson's Island. And they did it in the most backwards way possible. Because not only did they want to free all those prisoners, they wanted the ship that was there. And that was the USS Michigan. Or, well, yeah, it was the USS Michigan at the time and then then the Navy was like, we don't want you named like that, so we'll, they just named it the USS uh, Wolverine afterwards. But uh, to put it short, they hijacked two passenger ships, discarded the one passenger ship, left all the people that they had on board at a, on an island, and then they were found out almost immediately. And uh, it, I thought it was really funny that apparently... Uh, Apparently, when uh, they had a guy who was supposed to be masquerading as a Union officer, and pretty much they knew from the start, they just kind of let his let him do his little shtick before they were like, "Hey, we know that you're uh, <laughs> we know that you're not one of us." Um, and eventually, those guys uh, escaped over to to Canada. Um, and the other the other ship, they just kind of let go, and apparently, it grounded somewhere over somewhere over on the Canadian shore as well. So. Uh, I guess everything goes to Canada. Um, uh, and let's see, what else? Well, there's the Door County Peninsula, Washington Island, St. Martin's Island, around that area up there. Um, up in Lake Superior, we have the Apostle Islands. Very, very fascinating little area there. Um, there's a, as it, as it says, there's a lot of islands over there. Um, and a lot of interesting history. I think, I think they have like almost a dozen lighthouses over there, <laughs> purely on how dangerous it is. Um, Lake Superior also has the Keweenaw uh, Peninsula right here, and it's probably one of the most remote areas you'll still get on the Great Lakes. People, st people live there, but it is still remote as can be. Um, and that's kind of no that kind of tells you, hey, you're going to be turning downbound now. <laughs> um, you also have Isle Royal, uh, has about probably a shipwreck on shipwreck on each side <laughs> of it. Um, there's about, if I remember, about eight in total. Um, and you have some of the smaller islands that I uh, can't remember all the names to, um, but some I can mention are like Beaver Island. Um, oh boy, Beaver Island, uh, there's Gull Island on Lake Michigan, um, Mackinac Island, there's a lot of them. And if I, if I tried to name every single one of them, I uh, probably could be here for like 10 hours. 
I feel like a comedian right now. I, I really do. Um, anyways, <laughs> uh, there's also Thunder Bay up here. I kind of tend to forget about Thunder Bay. It's kind of just there. It's also Canadian. Nothing against you Canadians. Is there any Canadians in here? <laughs> just teasing. Um, and then uh, I haven't talked too much about Lake Ontario. There's n there is a lot of history on Lake Ontario. It just tends not to show up. Um, it does have the oldest shipwreck, though. Uh, it was a, a British sloop, I believe, built around, I think it was 18, or not 18, I think 1797. I think that's when it was built. And it sank somewhere in Lake Ontario. Um, and Lake Ontario is, uh, unfortunately, the dirtiest of the, of the five great lakes because she's getting everything from Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie. Just, she's getting everything. Um, including that runoff that Lake Erie unfortunately gets. Um, but I should probably go on. <laughs> um, so in this next slide, this is just what you're going to be seeing uh, in the future programs. Uh, there are going to be rescues. There's going to be tragedies. There's going to be storms, mysteries, shipwrecks, and much, much more. There are just, as I've said before, there are just so many really just neat, neat stuff that you can really find here. Um, here are some of the, uh, of the things you might see. Got the life-saving service, the precursor to the Coast Guard. You've got storms, huge, huge storms that uh, really wrecked the shipping. Um, two of the worst uh, that I can think of right now are 1905 storm and the 1913 storm. Um, few others... Uh, Black Friday storm on Lake Erie uh, in 1916, and the 1940 Armistice Day storm. All really fascinating stuff that I hopefully will get to eventually. Um, there's just a lot going on, and I will have to figure out how to <laughs> explain everything. Um, this next one here, this is a mystery. This is the Marquette and Bessemer number two. She is uh, one of the, she is the last car ferry ha that has yet to be found. Um, all the other car ferries that have sunk on the Great Lakes, which is not very many, mind you, um, she is the last one that has yet to be found. In this picture here, they are actually using dynamite to blow up the ice so it kind of pushes, pushes it away so they can get free from the ice. Um, and this is just a really fascinating story that will take a lot to try and figure out, too, because... Uh, there, there are so many testimonies that they said that she, they saw her here and she wasn't, and it was just confusing. <laughs> um, and obviously, probably the, one of the most famous shipwrecks down here, the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff about her. Uh, I might go into that just purely because she's so famous, um, but I can give you a little tidbit. Ashtabula was her last unloading port before she went back up to... Uh, up to Lake Superior um, and got loaded up again. And um, then after she got loaded up, she, she went on her last trip with the uh, Arthur Anderson in tow. And uh, um, there, are two, there were two gentlemen who were on there that were from Ashtabula, um, Paul Ripa and, oh, Carl thank you. I couldn't remember his name. All right. Now, do you have guys have any questions before we continue on? Just you can you shout it car, out. Car ferries. Yeah. Kind of cars were on Freight cars, like uh, railroad. Um, like later on, they would have uh, cars more on the top than anything, um, but it really usually was either some uh, you could go as like a passenger or. There, it's just the, the crew and a few freight cars. Um, but uh, this image here, um, I believe, is off of Cleveland. I could be wrong, but I, uh, I think I just found it, and I was like, man, that's cool. And then that's where it ended. <laughs> um, so let me... Okay, so that was the end of that one. All right. Are you guys ready for some ghost stories? Yeah. All right. Let it, uh, can somebody hit the lights? 
perfectly spooky. All righty. So before we talk about these ghost stories, or well, before I read them, we will do a little bit of history with these ghost stories. First one we'll be uh, looking at is the ghost of St. Martin's Island, not on the Mediterranean, on Lake Michigan. <laughs> All right, I'll read off of this because I don't have it memorized. St. Martin's Island, or St. Martin Island, Michigan. So it's roughly halfway between Wisconsin's Door Peninsula and Michigan's Garden Peninsula. Slightly smaller than 200 acres, the island is mostly rock bound. The light tower proper is six sided, composed of six steel posts, latisse together. Or I think it's, I think it's latisse. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> the height from base to lamp room is 57 feet. The original fourth order for now lens had a range of 24 miles. A brick keeper's building is nearby. The ghost on St. Martin's Island is supposed to be that of the light keeper, still searching for his lost children. As was the custom, the keeper's children attended school at, a near, at the nearby Washington Island, 10 miles to the southwest. Every day they rode to class in the morning and back again at dismissal, weather permitting. One terrible day when they were caught coming home at about halfway across, the children were caught in a vicious squall and they and their boat disappeared. Heartbroken, the old keeper desperately searched the shore looking for his missing offspring. His efforts were in vain. Their bodies were never recovered. Today, some say that when the lights are, nights are dark and stormy, the north wind blows down from, the, from an arctic hell. The faint gro green glow of the keeper's lantern can be, still be seen as he wanders along the island's desolate shore, ever searching. The other story, uh, the version of this ghost story, seems that one storm-blown night, the keeper failed to properly trim his wicks and the beam winked out. Without the trusty light to guide her, the schooner struck hard in the outlying shoal. Waves soon began to batter the helpless ship to pieces, and the crew counted their chances for survival as nil. Turned around in the black night and pummeled by the wild seas, they all lost all sense of the direction. Missing the steady gleam from the, night, from the light, they did not know which way the shore was. Surely their end was at hand. Suddenly, a small thin beam of green light pierced through the darkness. While it shimmered like an old handheld kerosene lantern, wobbling and flickering the cold wind, it burned true. Eagerly, the desperate men jumped into the cold lake and struggled for the dim but very welcome light. When they finally stumbled ashore, the mysterious light was not waiting on the beach for them, but instead it bobbed off in the distance. Anxiously, the crewmen walked towards it, past an old cemetery and up the twisting path through thick and forbidding forest. It always seemed to float somewhere just ahead of them. Where did I go? Okay, there we go. Blusters of wind tore at their, their wet and frigid bodies, and driving rain pelted them. All the while, the bedraggled crew followed the strange flickering glow. Finally, they stumbled into the small clearing. Ahead was the partially open door to the keeper's house, and a warm, welcoming, wel welcoming light leaking out into the forbidden night. When they entered, a bright burning green lens lantern was sitting on the table. It was the same beacon that had guided them to safety. Exploring further, the crew discovered the keeper lying stone-cold dead on his bed. His oilskins hung from a nearby wall peg. They were dry to the touch. No one else was on the island. The keeper hadn't carried the lantern out into the storm to guide them. Who did? The old tale continues that the official report only stated that the keeper died in the act of saving the crew. No mention was made of the strange green light in the crew, though they knew the truth. There was no doubt in their minds that it was a dead man who had saved them. A dead man in his light had led them to safety. In the following years, others reported seeing an unearthly green light. The ghostly lantern continued to search for shipwrecked crews to lead safely on the dangerous shore. And we will get into that story soon. But I will show you right here. This is St. Martin's Island right here. It kind of looks like a square, but it's okay. Um, Summer Island is right here. Poverty Island is right here, there's Rock Island, and then there's Washington Island. So can you imagine your kids are rowing to and fro from school, from St. Martin's Island, 10 miles to get to school? That's like, I can't even say, I don't, I don't think anybody who said that they walked 10 miles in the snow can say that. Uh, just being honest here. <laughs> 
but you can tell that is a quite a distance, and depending on where that, uh, where that school was. In this next picture, uh, I'm going to show you what the lighthouse looked like, and it's still there. It is still there. Um, it is in just pretty bad condition. Uh, the, the island is mostly desolate, um, but uh, building is still there. Um, hopefully, eventually, it, it might be open to the public again. Uh, Washington Island is pretty much open. Uh, I believe people live there, uh, but there's the tower itself, and there's the keeper's quarters, uh, and then there's the extra little building here. All right. Ooh, I'll squeeze through there. <laughs> All right. Now, usually, with these two, they would be sung. Well, the second one, not so much, but the first one kind of reads like a song, but I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> um, you guys don't want to hear that. All right. <clears throat> Again, thank you to Lee Murdoch uh, for allowing me to use his music uh, and his words. Uh, he's an amazing songwriter. If you guys ever get a chance to look up his music, I did play a little bit of it beforehand. Um, I suppose I could probably put on something, but you know, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> all right. If you all are ready, all right. <clears throat> St. Martin's Island lays to the entrance of Green Bay just a solitary citadel of stone. The mariners depended on her beacon burning bright, crosses the restless waters all alone. The shroud of a sad story surrounds the sullen space and is heard through the region far and near. There is a history of haunting imprinted every place of the old, old lighthouse keeper who lived here. When the night is a jagged black and the waves are on the rise, from a north wind that screams down from an arctic hell. The glow of the keeper's lantern can be seen along the shore of St. Martin's Island, ever searching. The island isolation was really quite ideal for the raising of a family, some say, but the children's education proved a difficult ordeal when the nearest school was 10 miles across the bay. When the weather permitted, those kids would sail to school. They'd take their lessons for the day and then return. One day a squall came up and they were lost without a trace. And ever since, that tortured keeper's lantern burned. When the night is a jagged black and the waves are on the rise, from a north wind that screams down from an arctic hell, the glow of the keeper's lantern can be seen along the shore of St. Martin's Island, ever searching. It was many years later in a monstrous midnight gale that the lamp up in the lantern room went dark, and caught in the tempest while running for the bay, the schooner Juno's helmsman missed his mark. She went up on the rocks, and she was pounded by the seas, a death struggle in the surging crest and trough, and confusion held its sway amid wind and rocks and spray, and the last few surviving crewmen went aloft. While clinging to the cross trees, Throughout this blackest night, those sailors with all hope and bearings completely lost, prayed to the Lord, our Father, to deliver them his grace. And each one bowed his head, their hearts they crossed. Then off in the distance, the helmsman saw a light, just a, spot, a bobbing soft green lantern, nothing more. So each one descended from their refuge on the wreck and then plunged through the breakers to the shore. They helped each other crawl through the crutch, clutching, crashing surf and heaved upon the beach to take their rest. But that little lantern light went a-drifting up the path towards the lighthouse tower on the crest. When they reached the keeper's quarters and walked through the entrance door that had been blown open in the storm, they found the keeper in his bed, and he had been long been dead. But the lantern at his side was very warm. When the night is a jagged black and the waves are on the rise, from a north wind that screams down from an arctic hell, the glow of the keeper's lantern can be seen along the shore of St. Martin's Island, ever searching. So that 
is probably one of my favorites, personally. It is, it's more of a, a song, as you can tell, where it kind of repeats itself. And the next one is a lot of fun. It's a little creepy, but it's a lot of fun. Let's see if I can find the clicker first. Now, as we did before, this I'll be telling a little bit of the history. So, this is the ship we're talking about. This is the Chicago Board of Trade. Um, she was a wooden three-masted pass, uh, package and bulk freighter. Bas basically, she would be carrying both goods while also carrying stuff like coal, uh, iron ore, whatever they could fit in her hull. Um, the, the story I'll be reading is The Ghost of Red Monroe. And I'll be doing an accent. So prepare that, prepare yourselves. Um, it is a very harrowing tale. I enjoy it. Um, I think it's pretty fun. Um, the real story was that she was carrying a load of iron ore when a storm pushed her into the Niagara Reef on Lake Erie, where she subsequently went to pieces on November 21st, 1900. The steamer J.K. Secor rescued the crew and no lives were lost. Now, something I did find interesting was the original reading of it had a ship called the Erie Board of Trade. The Erie Board of Trade never existed. It was, there was only the Chicago Board of Trade. So somebody had decided, I'm going to make a fake boat and put it in a song. <laughs> Lee Murdoch decided, well, I'm going to rectify that, and he decided to make the actual ship name right here, the Chicago Board of Trade. Now, obviously, it's a ghost story, probably fictional. I doubt there was a ghost on the ship, but again, you never know. Uh, I'll leave it up to you, uh, but I'll show you one more picture of it. Wow, wow, it got compressed. <laughs> it got compressed, it's okay. We'll go to the previous one. I just thought it was funny. Um, but here's a good side shot of the Chicago Board of Trade, as you can tell. Uh, just an old wooden boat. Um, all right. So get ready for the ghost of Red Monroe. I might sit for this one. I don't know. Fear hurting. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> You guys are ready. All righty. Come all ye, you ch true sailor lads, likewise you landsmen too. And I'll tell you of a strange event you may not think true. On the Chicago Board of Trade, a handsome craft is ever made. I signed on Jack Custer's crew. Now in those days, the food was good, but work aboard was tough. We'd scuff down the boat on upbound trips, and downbound, we'd pan her up. While loading in Chicago, we consigned for Buffalo, I met a red-haired Scotsman named Monroe. The, old, the whole trip down to Buffalo, the old man rode the crew, and he singled out Red Monroe the toughest jobs to do. We unloaded our consignment and cast off to Cleveland Town to take a load of coal, Milwaukee bound. But when we cleared the Buffalo breaker with a short pull from the tug, the wind died out completely we sat there bobbing like a jug. So we dropped our anchor overside and rode Lake Erie's floating, floating, flowing tide till the hook set in the bottom, nice and snug. Now with this delay, the captain called Red and two of us aft. The top mast for her to scrape down, and then the old man laughed. Red gave his boatswain, boatswain's chair a look, round ragged ropes, his fingers hooked, he said, I'll bend a bit of rattling around this chaff. The skipper, who'd been drinking, then turned on him and swore. So Red climbed the main rig like a cat and proceeded with his chore. With the halyards bent onto the chair, he sung out to us, Hoist away there! But I'll never forget the look that his face wore. Now we handled that line carefully, for tender was the chair. We hauled him up a chock-a-block and hanging in the air. Red, with his knife in one hand, leaned and reached for the, bla the back stay. It was then the bosun's chair gave way. 
At first he fell on in a bunch until he struck the cross trees, and then he spread out like a leaf floating in the breeze. He fell forward of the cabin to the deck, the starboard side. In a heartbeat, I was kneeling by his side. Now the old man hovered over him, swaying to and fro, and I was well choked up to see a shipmate laid out so. I said, this is bad business, sir. Just then, old Red, he began to stir and hissed these words out low. I curse the captain of the ship, his wife and children too, and I curse the Chicago Board of Trade, her owners and her crew. And every word choked past his lips or was stained, was stained with blood as it dripped. His head fell back, not another breath he drew. In three days, we made Cleveland, and a few of us left, the, left us there. But the wages down, most stayed on to finish out their share. While upbound through the rivers, there were five ships in our tow. And at Port Huron, we encountered a big blow. The squall was too much for the tug, and some feller cast us off. But he didn't sing out to us first, and we floundered in the trough. We dropped our bower quick and sure, but drifted as the rain did pour and settled back into the schooner, moonlight rough. The moonlight lost her headgear, and our lifeboat smashed in two. We were certainly a shaky lot, with Huron in full view. For there is nowhere a man can turn with no boat hanging from the stern, and a 500 miles of water to plow through. Next morn, the wind was easterly, the skies fair that whole day. By first watch of the evening, we were just off Saginaw Bay. And I had the second trick of the wheel. The stars shone bright as eight bells peeled, and every inch of canvas set and swayed. The captain climbed out on the deck as the last rig died away. Some spray caught me in the face, and it took my breath away. Then I saw it rise up slowly, cross the main from the starboard rail. It was milk, and white, milk white and transparent like a veil. When it reached the gaff and halyards, it was there it seemed to stall. But then it struck the cross trees and spread out like leaves that fall. I glanced over to the captain. He was watching it also. We were witnessing the ghost of Red Monroe. Next thing I knew, the ship and all aboard were in the wind. The main top mast and mizzen were both splintered in the din. The square sail yard in pieces and the booms were jibbing over, and the pap captain passed out face down by the door. Now they got their, the head sails over while I spun the wheel about. We got her back under control, though how, I have some doubt. For one glance at the binnacle, what I saw took me aback, for we were laying on our course, a starboard tack. The remainder of the trip passed without incident at all, and each crewman kept up unto himself, recounting that close call. And we, when we reached Milwaukee River and hove to the dark dock side, it was there that we left the ship where she had lied. Now my story's nearly, nearly ended, and you may not think it's true, but I swear to you, I saw it all. And you can act, ask Jack Custer too. For on the Chicago Board of Trade, the ghost of Red Monroe has played, and no true sailor would ever join her crew. So what'd you guys think of that story, huh? <laughs> Pretty wild, isn't it? <laughs> All right. So I thought this would be a good way to uh, try and extend this because I realized how short both of these were. Um, so these are a lot more lighthearted. I think you guys will get a chuckle out of these. I certainly did. Um, they're just really, really silly. Um, and if, if, if something catches my eye and if you guys have, again, if you guys have anything, you know, you want to know, just, you know, throw something at me. I don't mind. I won't catch it, but it'll hit me in the head. <laughs> All right. Let's see if I can figure this out. I got it. <laughs> All right. Ooh. Why are you leaning on me? This mic doesn't like me. <laughs> it's okay. I'm having it leaning up against me. Here we go. All right, we are good. Can you guys hear me? Alrighty. So 
So what I'm going to do real quick, actually, so I'm going to go to the other a little bit. Pretty much, a sailor yarn is a story. It's just really, it's a really short story that um, the sailors will probably tell around the table. Um, most of the time, they're really just silly or outlandish, but they're fun to read. So let me uh, get to it. Uh, and this was by, uh, this book that I am reading it from is by Tana Th Dana Thomas Bowen. Uh, he had, he had about three books uh, that he wrote about the Great Lakes, to my knowledge. Um, but he, it, it, it was of the time. It was released around the 1940s. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that obviously isn't going to be accurate now. But <clears throat> all right, Sailor Yarns. First one is called A Star Wheelsman. Back in the old schooner days on the Great Lakes, this yarn was often told. The night was clear and the sky was bright with countless stars. The breeze was just right to send the schooner along at a brisk clip. The hands were below, asleep. Only the skipper and the wheelsman were on the deck. The wheelsman was new aboard the ship, having signed on that day <clears throat> and knew, of, knew little of what was about him. The captain grew sleepy. He had a busy day getting the cargo loaded and putting off to sea. He yawned a great deal and finally Morpheus trembled, or, or triumphed, not trembled. Keep her nor nor west, and steady as she is, my boy, and she'll run along fine. I am a taken forty winks here on this bench, and the tired skipper to the new man at the wheel as he yawned again. What's nor nor west, sir? Is that the way we're going now? inquired the green man, gripping the wheel a bit firmer. Great Scott, groaned the captain. Captain, this man don't even know the compass. Then he had an idea. Surely this would work. Here, look, fella. See yonder star, that bright one up there, see? And the captain pointed upwards. After some difficulty, the wheelsman said he saw it. Well, then, head her nose right smack at that there star and keep her there, and you'll be all right. Forget the compass. Call me if you anything goes wrong, instructed the kipper, skipper as he stretched himself full length on the bench beside the wheel. Two hours later, the captain awoke. All was just as it had just been, had it, yeah had been when he had dropped off to sleep, except that the schooner was considerably off course. Hey, you, didn't I tell you to steer straight for that star? Now look where you got her headed, bellowed the enraged captain. And the wheelsman replied, yes, sir, I did that, sir. And would you believe it, sir, we passed that star long ago, and I had to pick me another one, explained the would-be navigator. All right, this next one. This is kind of going to go into the season, seeing how Christmas seems to start earlier and earlier each year. <clears throat> this is Jingle Bells. The wind was gusty and strong. It would blow out from one direction and then another. The skipper, standing on the bridge and tie, trying to dock his long freighter, was having a tough time, time of it. Back a little, ahead a little, stop, ahead more, back a bit, and, and stop. And so it went. What with the wind and the current, it was devilishly difficult to put his his ship on the exact spot. His signal, bell, his signal bells to his engineer rang sharply and almost continuously. The sweating engineer was having as hard of a time as the captain, perhaps harder. Stopping, starting, reversing, his huge engines required much more physical labor than merely ringing an engine room telegraph. Finally, with the, the much ringing of the bells and a great deal of shouting, coupled with considerate, effective swearing, the skipper managed to get all the lines ashore, made fast to the de desired location. All was well now. He came down off the bridge, paused on the deck, and decided to go down to the engine room and tell the engineer what a time he had to get her docked. Down he went there, and there to his astonished eyes, he beheld the chief struggling with his monstrous engines, pulling the lever and that, this lever and that, and in general, having a very tough time with it. Hey, what's the big idea, called the skipper to the engineer. We're in dock. Don't need to run the engines now. We're tied up. Maybe so, replied the Consentious engineer, but I'm just getting cut up with all those signals you've been a ringing. All right, next one. This is one of my favorites. I love this one. It's called Dollars to Donuts. And it does have donuts. A pleasing old sailor yarn is told in the recent issue of the Lake Erie Breeze. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not recent anymore. <laughs> just so you know. A publication of the Ashley and Dustin steamer line. Operators of the 
formally find a excursion steamer put in bay between Detroit and Sandusky. In the 1860s, 70s, and well into the 80s, there were more sailing boats than steamboats on the Great Lakes. There's clear sailing for the windjammers out in the lakes, but when they reached the mouth of the Detroit River, sailing conditions were different. Many passenger steamers picked up a considerable money on the side by towing schooners up, up the river to Detroit. There was a big fleet of tugs in these waters to handle this business, but nevertheless, the side wheelers were always on the lookout for sailing vessels to tow in. Captain Sela Dustin was running a snappy little side wheeler between Sandusky and Detroit in those days and towed many a sailing craft into the river. One day, in a dead calm, a schooner was laying out off of Bar Point at the mouth of the Detroit River. She had no signal to set for a tow, but was just riding out at anchor. The steamer Dart, Captain Sela Dustin in command, on her way up from Putten Bay, pulled over to the schooner, and the mate of the Dart threw a heaving line aboard the schooner. This was the regular way of inviting the captain of the schooner to send his tow line over to the Dart. To the dart. But the captain of the schooner threw the line off the deck. The captain of the Dart was not to be put off so easily and began to bargain with the schooner people. This dead calm may last for a week, roared Captain Dustin, and there's no telling when you will reach Detroit. I'll tow you in for $25. Not this ship, roared back the captain of the schooner. I've got plenty of time to wait for a breeze. Family's all on board and plenty of grub and tobacco. And my wife is a good cook. Just then, the tantalizing aroma of hot cooking was wafted aboard the side wheeler, and Captain Dustin, with his mouth watering, said, Maybe you're frying donuts? They sure do smell good. Captain Dustin weakened as the delicious aroma of the fried cake sailed over from the schooner's galley. And finally, he called over, I'll tell you what I'll do, Captain. Just send me over a mess of those donuts, and I'll tow you up for $10. The donuts and the schooner's tow line came over without further delay. Next one is uh, Cold Lying. This one's pretty, uh, pretty funny, too. 30 degrees below zero is pretty cold. For many long hours, the crew had battled to put their freighter into port at, uh, I, I got missed, I kind of like lost my spot there, <laughs> port at Fort William, the Canadian head of the Great Lakes, and there to tie up for the winter. If they were able to reach dock before night, uh, yeah, d dark before dark, they might be b get back to their homes by Christmas. But it was tough going. Ice was forming fast, and it was all the, sh the ship could do to force its way through. Several times it looked at those, the ice would close in on the vessel and lock it fast until spring. At last, they made the harbor, and the skipper donned all his togs and some of the mates and went out on the icy bridge in the sub-zero twilight to supervise the docking of his ship. He directed that the vessel be tied up at the nearest available dock. The ship had just been placed exactly on the spot that the captain wanted, and the lines were being made when a hysterical, irate individual came running and shouting down the dock, waving his arms wildly. He galloped to the bow and looked up to where the captain stood on the bridge, high as a six-story building. Hey, you can't dock here, he bellowed to the skipper. You'll have to get out of here. This is a private dock. Get out. He waved his arm and shook his fist frantically. So just imagine just something like that. <laughs> the weary skipper was thinking fast. Just a few more minutes was all that he needed, and nature would take care of the rest. He cupped his hands before, behind his muffled ear. I can't hear a thing you say, he shouted down to the wildly gesticulating man on the dock. And lying like a good sailor he was, added, wait a few minutes and I'll come down and see you. Get out of here. Get this boat away from here. You hear that? He bawled at the skipper. I still can't hear you, roared back the old man from his lofty bridge, still lying. He crossed over to the opposite side of the, of the ship and looked down at the rapidly freezing water. Already the vessel was gripped fast in ice, and they were safe until spring. Nothing short of dynamite could move that ship, ship now. Guess it'll be all right to go down and see that feller, he remarked to the frozen atmosphere. We're in a four dark and snugly berthed for winter. Owners will pay him well for his dockage. Ho oh, hum, it's sure a freezing fast. <laughs> it just cracks me up. Just, and you can see just these guys had so much fun just making these up. And I'm sure some of them are real stories too. I can imagine some skipper doing that. The next one uh, is pretty fun. Uh, 
don't read it as often, but I will read it now. Whistle away. Like most of the sailor yarns in this book, this one is, to claim, is claimed to be on truth, of, tru, uh, of, true, of a true story. See, it already messed me up. <laughs> it, already, it has to do with the advent of a steam whistle, that indispensable mariner's aid. It'd be impossible now to safely navigate the waters of the Great Lakes without the whistle. His first thought of the men in charge of the ships when danger threatens. Even the lowly rowboat equipped with an outboard motor is required by law to carry a whistle, albeit blown by the lung power of a boatman. Um, the tale of the first Great Lakes whistle follows. William McGee, fiery Irishman and chief engineer of the old steamboat Rochester, was outfitting and overhauling a ship during the winter of 1843 to 44. In the harbor of Buffalo, he had run across a description and plans of a crude steam whistle in the foreign paper and was experimenting with the contraption during the overhauling of the Rochester. The result of his labors brought forth the first steam whistle. It produced an ear-splitting, terrorizing blast that frightened all those who were unfortunate to be within the sound of it. It was installed at the Rochester when she sailed the following spring, more for the novelty of, of, any th uh, of the thing than any practical reason. Engineer McGee numbered among his enemies one captain, Charles L. Gager, master of the steamer General Porter. On her first trip up the lakes that season, the Rochester overtook the General Porter near, near Boy Blanc Light in the Straits of Mackinac. She ran alongside the General Porter. McGee was ready with his whistle. The fun-loving engineer let out with, with the blood-curdling blast on his new contraption. He blew it long and loud, and it started, startled Captain Gager and his good crew almost out of their senses. The Rochester then pulled ahead of the General Porter and docked at Mackinac. Mean, meantime, the General Porter followed along the same route. Her captain was furious at the insult to himself and her crew. He vowed dire vengeance when he, he next saw the Rochester. His chance came when he reached the Mackinac, for when he arrived there, he found the object of his wrath tied to the dock. Upon docking his ship, Captain Gager hurried over to the Rochester, and unaware that his archenemy, McGee, was the man who had given him the raspberries, he shouted from the dock for the man to come forward that he had made a, such a squawk at him. McGee hopped, hopped to the dock obligingly, loud and harsh words, Filled the air, fists started flying, and bystanders halted the fracas. McGee's steam whistle soon became an object of interest to ship owners and operators. In place of it being the mere novelty, became an, a useful adjunct to the vesselman, and the soon replaced the old time bell and cannon. Ashore, factories found it useful. The whistle, born in strife, was here to stay. Next one, as the book saith. Daylight was just breaking over the water after a wild and stormy night. The lighthouse keeper climbed the long flight of spiral stairs and extinguished the light and hung its cloth covering around it to protect it from the bright, the bright sun rays that might soon peep out from the east. He looked far below at the troubled waters. Huge waves broke and roared upon the shore. White water tumbled as, about as far as the eye could see. What was that fleck of different white out yonder? The grizzled lighthouse keeper grabbed his binoculars and adjusted him to his eyes. Located the, uh, located the white fleck, it floated sluggishly in the water. Great Caesar, groaned the, the keeper. It's a small gasoline cruiser, and he's tied his shirt up as a flag mast. It's a wonder he floats at all in this sea. Distress call, sure enough. Down those long stairs, the keeper went straight to a surf boat. He hurried to launch it into the heaving seas. He shouted for his assistant, who presently appeared and lent the old man a hand. The distressed cruiser had also been sighted by a passing truck driver, off to an early morning start along the road at the top of the bluff. He had turned off the highway and was coming down the little side road to the, to the lighthouse. He left his truck and came to where the men were launching their small boat. Hey, you fellows, see that cruiser out there? He shouted above the noise of the breakers. The two workers nodded silently. You're not a going out there in that little tub, are you? He asked in amazement and continued helpfully. You'll never get back if you do. Mister, said the old keeper, turning to the stranger, our book says here we have to go out. It doesn't say we got to come back. All right, let me... Here's the next one. This is Scotty's bookkeeping. Scotty Blake was an old-time steamboat fireman. 
He, was a he had a steady job aboard the steamer Frankie Kirby, which had sailed years from Detroit. His credit was good at Baltimore Reds, which is a bar. Scotty, taking his regular drink, sometimes a bit more paid Baltimore Red every payday. Scotty, however, had a growing suspicion that he was paying, paying for more drinks than he consumed. In order to keep tab on himself, Scotty would take a coffee bean from the breath dish on the end of the bar and put it in his pocket. When he settled with Red, he would count the beans at a bean to drink and so, so to check pretty closely with Red's books. This bright idea worked fine until Connie, the dock boss, got next to, got next to Scott, Scotty's tactics and decided to do something about it. One evening in the fall, right at payday, all was merry at Red's and, and a goodly crowd of sailors was there. Connie worked in close to Scotty and slipped a handful of coffee beans into the unsuspecting individual's pocket. Well, when Scotty came to check up, he protested before he even saw the bill. The night Scotty changed boats and shipped north on a lumber hooker and remained at the lumber camps all winter. All right, let me see what this one is. Okay, yeah, I know that. <laughs> so I'm going to one. All right, that jug of wine. Cut rates and price wars raged in the old days, even as they do today. Along in the 1840s, more ships were in the lakes trade than the amount of business warranted. The old economic law of supply and demand quickly brought out drastic... Uh, let me see where I am. I, drastic cuts in rates among the ships and passengers were often hauled free of charge, just to beat a rival line. The story of the captain whose ship lay at a dock in Buffalo, awaiting passengers in those times, is interesting. The captain was approached by a traveler and asked what his cabin rates were to Detroit. The captain, anxious for business, promptly quoted a rate that was about one half his regular one. The traveler was invited aboard the ship to look her over, and free drinks were served as an extra inducement. The traveler, however, decided to shop further. Later, he was found by the captain and was asked what he had decided. The crafty traveler informed the skipper that he had found another ship that would carry him free. Well, in that case, said the captain, I'll do the same. And besides, I'll give you all your meals also. And he's like, no, I don't think I'll ride with you, replied the shopper. You see, I believe I like his wine better than yours. All right. Next one. I, oh, yeah, I remember this. This is fun. Landlubber lady. Probably the, old, the most up-to-minute yarn is about the skipper who had just been equipped with the new radio telephone ship-to-shore apparatus. This is where I got it from. The ship was banging through a stiff wind upbound on Lake Huron. And early in the evening, the captain decided to try the new contrivance by putting a call to his wife. The call was put through promptly, and the, sh and the skipper heard a shrill voice of his wife's sister on the land end of the connection. That you, Tilly? he shouted. And in response, he said, sure, it's me. Who would you suppose it was? Mary's gone to the movies, and I came over to stay with the kids until she gets back, came the reply. Then she added, what are you shouting so for, Jack? A person would think you'd never used a phone before. Well, I never did, I never did not just like this. He went on to explain, this one's on the ship, and we're out in Lake Huron. And then she replied, land sakes, Jack, how can you think of the darndest jokes? The good landlubber lady remarked. The conversation ended shortly. When Mary returned, her ever suspicious sister, innocent of marine affairs, informed her that Jack had phoned her and that she was certain he had been drinking a bit too much. He said he was out in Lake Huron and that it was rough and the waves were banging against the ship. Seems to me if them wires out there was a rising and a falling on the waves, I'd heard it on the telephone, the good sister remarked. All right, look out. The night was dark and the freighter plowed her way through the darkness. The, the captain was in the pilot house with the helmsman, and the lookout was stationed at his post in the extreme bow of the ship. Suddenly, the men in the pilot house saw another ship bearing down on them. Quickly, the captain ordered the ship to turn to avoid a collision, just in the nick of time. Two vessels slid past each other with little despair. The lookout in the bow had never said a word. The skipper was furious. Did you see that ship a-coming? He bawled at the lookout. Sure, I saw it, replied the young man smartly. Didn't you? You should have reported seeing it just as soon, as soon as you first spied it. That's your duty, admonished the old skipper, disgustedly. Oh, yeah, replied the smart lookout. Maybe I could have seen it sooner if I had climbed it out on that there steering pole. Want me to try it next time? The hardened old captain felt his hand closing into a, into a fist. 
but he turned away from his fresh lookout and mumbled something terrible in his beard as he returned to the pilot house. The young lookout was fired at the next port. Time went on and a year passed and he was still without work. He decided to write the old skipper for his job back. But the captain wasn't a man to forget or forgive. He smiled as he read the letter from his snippy for former lookout and he sat down and, and scrawled across the bottom of the letter, why don't you climb out on a steering pole somewhere and see if you can't see a job? All right, haste and waste. This yarn is told with a chuckle by an old mate on a lake passenger ship. A taxi rushed down to the dock and came to a quick stop with a great howling of brakes and scraping of tires. A nervous little man with a large suitcase popped out. I'll make it all right, he shouted over his shoulder to the driver as he rushed pell-mell to the water's edge. The ship was now two feet from the dock. With his hat pulled down tight over his head and clutching fast to his suitcase, the man pushed aside the restraining hands of the men on the dock and made a flying leap to the deck of the ship. He was caught by the mate as he skidded forward. Gosh, that was close. I almost missed the boat, said the man all out of, out of breath, but I made it. Uh, yeah, and then the mate responded. You sure did, mister, answered the ship's officer. But what's your hurry? Why the hell don't you wait until we get to the boat up to the dock? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Uh, and I believe yeah, there's a few more. Oh my goodness, that's a long one. Holy crap. All right. <clears throat> Many stories are told of the shortcomings of the lookout, the sa that safety man of the crew who stands as lonely watch in the bow of his ship. <coughs> when any activity is sighted, he reports it to the navigating officer. An Irishman was given the job of lookout on an early steamer of the Great Lakes. Ever watchful and mindful of his instructions, the new lookout hailed the bridge on his first night on duty. Well, I, see, I see something straight ahead, sir, he, he reported. What do you see, roared back the officer. Begora, sir, I don't know what I see. It has, it has red and green lights. Sure now, it, maybe it's a drugstore. And that one was called Seagoing Pharmacy. All right. <clears throat> oh boy, this, this one, I kinda, it, the guy they're making fun of, I'm like, kind of reminds me of myself, just purely for his stature. It's called A Large Party. Half a century ago, a dozen or so warehousemen and stevedores sat on the deck in Detroit awaiting the arrival of a steamer. Many and varied were the topics of the conversation, and in some manner, Pontius Pilate came up to the discussion. The deep-throated sound of the incoming ship's whistle interrupted their talk, and the men strolled over to the dock's edge to see their steamer tied up. The captain was at his post on the vessel's bridge, directing the docking. He was a very large man with a tremendous paunch. The local wit saw his chance and, sh and shouted, Look, fellows, there he is in the flesh, old Pontius, P Pilot. <laughs> Pontius Pilate himself. Let's see. I'm trying to remember what this one was. All right, so this one's a little bit of a longer one. Um, okay, this is the follow-up system. Lake navigation today is a systematic business. Definite schedules of the freighters are maintained and the dispatchers in the home office of any fleet can spot where their ships are on the chart at any moment. Aboard ship, the masters know almost where they are in their sleep, but this is today. Years ago, things were not so definite. Captain Bluff sailed the lakes years ago, and some of the old timers still recall his type. He was a gruff old guy with a bellowing fearsome voice, a huge frame, big fists, and a canny brain. How he ever managed to obtain his papers to navigate a ship was never clearly understood by outsiders, but he had them, and he managed to get a freighter to command. He was almost always the most careful about picking his mate. Captain Bluff always made certain that his mate knew navigation, and if there's any doubt that the matter, old Bluff looked farther. He also liked a mate that didn't require much sleep, one that could, he could brobeat. One foggy evening f found Captain Bluff's ship passing Port Huron, upbound and entering Big Lake Huron. Then they followed another freighter up the, up, up the St. Clair River, leading to the lake. I'm sick, Captain, said the luckless mate to the bluff. Just at this point, I gotta go lay me down. Can't stay, stay up no longer. And growled the captain, what's the matter with you? You ain't getting delicate, are you? He glanced ahead of the freighter they were following and grinned to, to himself. All right, go lay down, I'll carry on, bluff told his mate. The mate went below. 
What's, what course now, sir? inquired the wheelsman of, the, of, of Captain Bluff when they were alone in the pilot house. Captain Bluff really didn't know now that his mate was not on the deck, but he was prepared. Might as well just follow that boat ahead. That'll save us setting a course. We'll let him do the work. Fog's not so, si so thick, but what you can see is his lights. Keep your peepers on him and don't lose him. And he'll show us the way to Duluth with no trouble. Yes, sir, said the wheelsman. Captain Bluff dozed in the quiet comfort of the pilot house, and the fog lifted, and his wheelsman could follow the ship ahead without difficulty. So on through the night went the ship under the command of Captain Bluff. Then came the dawn. They were still a respectable distance astern of, of the leading ship. But land was appearing on their bows, where ordinary no land should be. Something was definitely wrong, and the wheelsman awaked, awakened his captain. Something's wrong, sir. I ain't never saw no land off in there before. Not so soon, anyhow, complained the puzzled man at the wheel, and continued, I've been a-following that there boat all night, and there she still is. Great Caesar, Caesar, something's surely wrong. Call the mate, sick or no, fetch him here. Quick, I'll steer, cried the follow-up captain. Presently, the mate appeared at the pilot house doorway. Hey, where are we? roared the captain to his mate. Looks like, sort of like Goderich to me, replied the mate. Yes, sir, by gosh, that's, that's where she, what she is. Sure enough, Goderich. Goderich, shouted Captain Bluff. What's the feller ahead go, a going to Goderich for? Ain't never seen this happen before. Turn us about and set a course for Duluth quick. Six hours lo lost already. Hurry now and look sharp. Ring the engine room for more speed. We gotta make time now. The swip ship swung her prow outward into the lake towards the Duluth course as the mate and the wheelsman compared notes. Won't say it's any of my mistake, Bluff said to himself. He turned to the mate and said, You take over for now, mister. I guess you can stand it. I'm going below and get me some rest. Yes, sir, replied the mate as he winked at the wheelsman. I'll wire the office that we was hung up in the fog last night so soon as we get to the Sioux. We'll never know the difference, remarked Bluff to himself, and the old scoundrel pulled up the covers and slept soundly, knowing the mate was on watch. All right, next one is the paper losses. Here is a true yarn told by a shipowner on himself. We'll call his vessel the Lumber King, which, of course, is not its real name but a good one for our purpose. The Lumber King had outlived her usefulness, at least until more money would spend on, on it to repair this and that. But one day along came a man who wanted to buy her for purposes of his own and enhance a profit to the present owner. Would the owner fix her up and sell her? He most certainly would. Further negotiations were carried on by mail for a long time, the prospective purchaser living in another lake city. But finally, the deal fell through, and the owner was thoroughly discouraged. He short, shortly ordered the old lumber king dismantled, and the wreckers attacked the ship with a will and, and commenced cutting up the boilers and the engines in high glee. For three days they labored and felt they had done a good job. Parts, very vital parts of the old ship, were all cut up and lying about the deck. A real wrecker enjoys nothing more than a wrecking. On the fourth day, the scourge owner arrived at his desk, and on it lay a telegram from his former prospect, and informed him that the individual was on his way to buy the ship for cash, and was bringing the check to cover in full with him. The distraught owner hurried over to the dock to look over the dismembered lumber king. Alas, too late. The wreckers had done their work too well. The ship was now beyond redemption. He thought of the, that check and the would-be buyer had it in his pocket for him. He became ill as he looked woefully at the wreckage strewn about him and returned sadly to his office. The would-be buyer was there waiting, the owner mournfully explaining what had just happened. Too late, just four days too late. Then it was the buyer's turn to feel ill and to think that I had this ship sold to another feller for twice what I was going to pay you for it, he groaned. Too late, sighed the owner. Too bad, sighed the, the buyer. He tore the check in tiny pieces and tossed them ruefully into the wastebasket. And then we got the last one. All right. <clears throat> this is nautical chopsticks. A lake captain who was asked by his wife to look into some pianos while in Detroit with a view of buying one for her wrote home to her with the following letter. Now this letter is going to be in, in sailor terms. So a lot of it might not make sense. <laughs> and he's describing a piano, keep in mind. I saw a piano that I believe will suit you. Black walnut hull, strong, strong bulkheads, strengthened fore and aft 
with iron frame, sealed with white wood and maple, rigging steel wire and double on the rat lines, and whipped wire on the lower stays, and heavier cordage, belaying pins of steel and well-driven home, length of the taffrail over all, six feet, two inches. This light draft makes the craft equally serviceable in the high seas or low flats. It has two martingales, one for the light airs and the zephyr winds, and one for the strong gusts and sudden squalls. Both are worked with footrests near the keelson, handy for the quartermaster and out of sight of the passengers. The running gear from the handrail to the cordage is made of white wood and holly, works free and clear, strong enough for the requirements of a musical tornado, and gentle enough for the rec requiem of a departing class. Hatches, black walnut, can be battened down, battened down proof against 10-year-old boys and commercial drummers, or can be clued up on occasion and cheated home for a first-class instrumental cyclone. I sailed the craft a little and thought she had a little a list to starboard. Anyhow, I like the starboard side better than the port, but the shipkeeper told me that the owner had the other craft of, of like tonnage waiting sail on the charter, which, which we were on, ju on just even keel. Yours, Jack, from the Lake Erie Breeze. And that was the final... Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's yarn. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed those. Those are just little, just a little fun stories. The mouth is getting dry though. So, <laughs> um, so what's the book that those came from? What's it called? Lore of the Lakes. <laughs> it is a very, very good book. Um, he, I know, here at Ashtabula we have uh, his third book, Shipwrecks of the Great Lakes. <laughs> Or shipwreck, I think it's shipwrecks of the lakes. There's also memory of the memories of the lakes as well. Uh, I believe this was the first one, and then you had memories of the lakes, and then shipwrecks of the of the lakes. What year was that published? This was. I gotta open it up. <laughs> see, let's see. Uh, it was first published September of 1940, and it's been pretty much republished ever since then. Um, this most recent one that I have here. Uh, this was the 12th printing, uh, which was uh, printed about March 1989. Um, and each one of them has their own little stories. Um, uh, one that I probably will do in the future is the, uh, the Tashmu in the city of Erie. Uh, it's a, uh, it was a real event that happened. Uh, they had decided they were going to race these two passenger steamers. One was brand new, the other one was a little older. Um, and they would race from, if I remember correctly, I think it was... Cleveland to Erie, and it meant that they had to uh, put all the uh, kind of stuff that was sticking out in so they could be more streamlined. Now, the one on the outside, the Tashmu, had a big advantage because she was newer, um, and she was in deeper water. Uh, the city of Erie, she was a lot slower, um, and uh, there's a lot of stories about it of when they went past because they went back cl past Cleveland, Fairport, you know, all the, all the different small towns along the, along the lake and heck, even in Ashtabula. Um, and at the time, if you want to know how they got the mail, like how they got like the updates, they had a carrier pigeon. They sent it to each, each guy along the time. And I, I really hope I get some time to read it to you guys because it's a lot of fun and I, I can try and do like a, one of those voices that is like a, for the old timey voices. Um, but one of the funniest things that happened during that whole thing, um, the Tashmu was pretty well ahead. Um, and uh, thankfully, at some point, uh, the water on the city of Erie's side got a lot deeper. Um, and they were able to start catching up. And they did come out the winners by, I think that was about 46 seconds. Um, and by boat standards, that's pretty good. Um, but the funniest thing that I found out was as they were racing, um, down in the engine room, uh, the, you know, the, both, both ships had, you know, the guys in the engine room, they were working hard. Keep in mind, there was a few hours that they were doing this. And uh, one of the valves on the engine blew off. And so, quick thinking, one of the guys, he was like, he just decided he was going to sit on it. And he sat on it throughout the entire thing, and they won. <laughs> so that tells you something, uh, you know. It's <laughs> and, and it's kind of what I explained earlier. There is just stuff like that just, 
you don't find anywhere else. You really don't. I mean, you know, the oceans have really interesting history. They do. But I have never found such interesting, you know, local, just fascinating things out from the Great Lakes. Just there are so many stories I could tell you. I really could. Like, I could probably stand here for more than, more than a year talking about every single one of these because they, some of them crack me up. Some of them are really sad, too. Um, but really, I mean, I mean, I even have my own sailor yarns. I, I still, here, I'll give you one. So when I was on the Herbert C. Jackson uh, for the first time over uh, as part of the Interlake Fleet, we had gone up to uh, Munising, and then we had headed over to Marquette. And a gentleman who had been helping me throughout the entire voyage, uh, figuring out things, kind of took me under his wing, was named Mike. And he was wanting to show me how we checked the, um, oh, I, I, my brain just completely lost it. Yeah, it was, yeah. The, uh, can't think of it now. Man, this has ruined my story. <laughs> No, it was the it, uh, ballast. There we go. Yeah, it was the ballast. Uh, and how you do that is you have about a foot-long rod, and you use chalk, chalk it up. And it's, it's spliced to a line that you let down into this small little pipe that goes down into the ballast tanks. Um, and then you'll bring it up, and if it's wiped off, you know that your tanks are good, depending on how you want them. Um, and... Well, we got the first one okay, but we went to the second one. And keep in mind, at Marquette, it was raining. It was pouring. We, it, we had to get there pretty soon because we were almost in a gale. And, uh, well, we get this, this second one, you know, got chalked up and uh, had it going down into the, uh, yeah, ballast tank. And, uh, well, as we were pulling it up, I guess we didn't feel it get any lighter. But as we pulled it out, we didn't have the rod. The rod was gone, and I don't know how. It's supposed to be spliced, and the rope was still attached. Like, it was still, you know, like, it hadn't been broken or anything. So I have no idea how that happened, but I still remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what really cracked me up is we probably stood there for, like, f at least five minutes look looking down at the little pipe and then back at each other and down at the pipe and back to each other. And then finally we were like, we had to like admit defeat. So we're, we had to go up to the, um, the windlass, which is where the two front anchors uh, in the bow are, are uh, held. And uh, there's also uh, one of the rods over there. It's more, it's kind of like an extra rod. I don't know how much it is used. I do remember as we went into the, uh, the one main room, um, the first mate laughed at us after, after we explained what happened. So <laughs> there was that. Um, but uh, so we go into the, uh, we go into the windlass. And uh, now I told you, this thing is about, the one I, we had was about a foot long. You know, it wasn't too, it wasn't too bad. This other one, it was six foot. So I had to carry this six foot rod. Yeah, like. Like I had to carry it under my arm as we went down the deck like this, and we were we were tied up, so there uh, the the uh, lines were like stretched out, and they're they're steel cables. So I had to somehow climb over the steel cables, yeah, <laughs> to get over it. And I, I don't think I'll ever forget it because I just remember having to walk like this all the way down, <laughs> um, and again. As I've mentioned before, you can see just even, even though I didn't do it for very long, and I'm eventually planning on going back out um, eventually, but e even just with my short time sailing, I, I already have too many stories to count. Um, How do they pay you? Like an hour? Uh, I, I believe it's it's pretty much by like pretty much by the hour. I believe, um, like. But we get our pay at the end of the month. Um, I believe that's how it works. I, I didn't really kind of get into that. Like, obviously, I got paid. You were, you were hourly. Yeah, it was hourly. But then 
then you get like the full payment at the end of the month. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, that's how it kind of worked. Um, and it, it, it paid really well. Um, and uh, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I just, I work better with my brain than my hands. So that's why I'm planning on trying to maybe become an officer down the line. So that's at least my plan, <laughs> of course. But um, really, uh, I really hope you guys enjoyed this, um, this program. Uh, went a lot better this time. I was surprised. But <laughs> I was a little bit more confident, I guess. Um, but uh, I didn't get a clap. Thank you. <laughs>